Right, so uh, it's actually the panel today is um, Arun Ram, uh, Arun Ramaratnu, but we know him as Arun Ram better. Arun and I have worked together on Bakam Bangal for many years, and Arun is also now the director of the Wikimedia chapter in India. So um, anything that you hear about in terms of Wikipedia's activities in India, it's coming from the organization that Arun is the head of. Arun is going to introduce all this. Thanks. Uh, it's always difficult to have the final session of the day, so we will keep this as interactive as possible. So, um, first of all, um, I would like each of the panelists to give a Twitter-like update about themselves so that the audience knows who they are. Today we have a little bit of a loaded panel with, with you know, the, the game changers, so to speak, the Microsoft, the Yahoo's. Uh, well, let me say what I want to say about you guys. <laughs> yeah, ground rule number one, the, the, the chairs, uh, you know, decision is final, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, then we have to balance it off, um, you know, a gentleman from the system integration side. Uh, so first of all, let me just request the panel to sort of uh, briefly, a uh, couple of sentences to introduce yourself, starting with uh, NRB. Hi, guys. Good evening. Uh, I'm called as uh, Yana, as short as possible. I'm known as Narayan Ramanathan. I'm the global head for GIS and telematics practice from uh, Mahindra and Mahindra Group and uh, family in this industry for uh, 15 years, similar to Kiran, eat, sleep, and live with uh, kind of you know programming, GIS, and so on. I've been in the advisory committee for Government of India for NSDI, and I'm also the technical board of director for clients for the 4G initiative in India, and uh, the Galileo Masters Award winner from the European Space Agency. So I govern them on the Galileo implementation on LBS and uh, navigation techniques. Hi, uh, I'm Satyan Kurd. I'm an engineering manager with uh, Google uh, India here uh, we, as part of the Geo product area. Uh, we look after the MapMaker product uh, that some of you might be familiar with. I've been in the Geo area for many, uh, many several years. Before that, Google, I was with Nokia working on several uh, products, including Nokia Maps, uh, for a few years before that. Folks, Rajesh Shirvastav, I work with being Microsoft. Uh, my, my area of focus is a local and any uh, any application tools platform that have a local intent. Uh, before this, I was with Microsoft US and uh, with, with MSN and online services. Before that, I was in Equifax as a enterprise software uh, manager. Uh, hi, I'm Sunil Pai. I work at Yahoo on maps.yahoo.com. I'm a tech lead on the team. Um, and I also, um, I'm involved in implementing mapping solutions across different properties inside Yahoo. Thanks so much. We have a really exciting set of panelists here. First of all, uh, probably a bit of um, um, explanation of the format that we'll follow today. We've got an hour, and uh, the organizers willing, maybe, and the interest willing, maybe a few minutes more. Uh, essentially, the way we're going to structure this is uh, we have about four different segments, um, and then uh, so essentially the way it work, it will work is that we can, I kind of introduce a certain segment and the panelists will go around. One of them will actually uh, introduce that uh, segment and share their thoughts, and then some of the other panelists will chime in. And at the end of that segment, we will open it up for questions. So we typically will have five minutes for questions and maybe towards the end as well. Uh, we would request people asking questions to be very brief, because uh, even the <coughs> folks in the audience are going to be very crisp in the responses. The idea is to get as many questions as we can, so that we have a lot of perspectives from the audience as well. Um, so that's pretty much the format. Um, well, uh, first of all, maybe um, uh, we have a pretty interesting panel, so to speak. Uh, the geospatial industry is, is, is right now at a very exciting moment. Um, uh, you know, if you actually compare it to the larger IT industry, which is about 3.6 trillion in terms of its size, um, it, people are really struggling to actually um, uh, size the beast, if you will. No one's really able to put it. There's no reliable report today that actually can authoritatively say what the size of the geospatial industry is. Uh, there are a couple of um, reports that come in, especially a Massachusetts-based company, uh, which sort of has been trying to give um, indications of what the size of this industry is, but it's, there are lots of debates on its size. Um, for example, uh, the GIS industry is estimated to be around 10 billion uh, globally in a couple of years, whereas India's own, uh, you know, geospatial industry as per FIKI is going to be about 23 billion in a couple of years, which is sort of the 
official FICI number that's sort of been released. So I think there's, um, um, the other thing as all of you know is that, you know, we have quite a few people from Yahoo, Google, and, and you know, Microsoft, and, uh, you know, these companies have obviously made it quite exciting for the, the average consumer of the internet to sort of get closer to the geotechnology space, if you will. And uh, their sense has also sort of uh, shaken up the traditional GIS players who have, you know, who kind of been pretty much uh, started off client-based and are kind of moving rapidly to the to the cloud-based space as well. So given that, um, you know, I think uh, there's also a lot of, um, um, you know, exciting stuff happening around data, uh, especially with, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the sort of uh, acquisitions that happened on Teleatlas or for that matter, Navtech by Nokia, etc. And now with OpenStreetMap sort of, uh, you know, doing what it is, everybody knows about it. So the challenging times in terms of how data would be, uh, you know, um, you know, how is OSM going to transform the space? What is the kind of, um, you know, how are the current uh, players in this space going to monetize things, so to speak, and how successful they be and how things will shape up? And how will the end user experience change as well? There are also other dimensions. Uh, most of today's discussions happened around, you know, the APIs and, you know, a lot of uh, what startups are doing and how applications in the mobile space, etc. Um, the other uh, aspect that we hope to touch upon in the panel is also with regards to applications of the geospatial industry, specifically uh, in industry verticals, as well as in terms of how governments are actually trying to use that, which we believe are three different spaces, the consumer, the industry, as well as the, the government, so that those are three different spaces. Um, we, also, okay. uh, we also hope to sort of uh, touch upon, uh, you know, a bit of the standards debate, and there's a lot of uh, work happening in terms of standards with the uh, o OGC, as well as the OSGO folks who are also trying to do a lot of work with the FOS4J events as well. And, um, uh, you know, we'll probably wrap it off with a little bit of uh, uh, touch upon the trends and a few takes and a bit of crystal ball gazing. So that's sort of what we intend to cover. Uh, so there'll be four, four segments for the day. The first one, uh, given the fact that we have uh, folks, for three of the folks are from the companies that do this, we will uh, focus on the initial segment for about 20 minutes around uh, mapping APIs and data and issues around it. Um, and uh, I will request, um, um, you know, um, so we'll sort of kick it off for the uh, so, I've been working at Yahoo since December uh, on maps.yahoo.com and uh, the developer story is pretty simple, like uh, as much data as we can in as standardized a format as we can get. Uh, there's a data layer and there's an interface layer. There be, be, uh, recent entrants into this are people like Tilemill and Leaflet and a whole bunch of open solutions. Uh, but the, these are our tools that on the developer side we try to get together and present to the user as an experience or as an interface. Um, so yeah, uh, there are some recent things that have made this a little more exciting for us, especially in the web field, uh, stuff like geolocation and uh, the fact that there are many, many of our users who are willing to check into places that they go and signal intent. Uh, uh, this is all data that is coming back to us. Uh, that's one thing that I wanted to really touch upon. And uh, the fact that we are now getting other sources of data, for example, photos for a while now that are uh, geotagged. So uh, this leads us to have like interesting analysis and interesting interfaces to present back to the user. The Flickr map is essentially my favorite example. It's really nice and it makes sense. Uh, we might be, I mean, even Google Maps has a layer for photos. The sort of thing that gives a view of what the place is. Um, and finally, I, uh, we get a lot of our data from Nokia. If you didn't know, uh, Yahoo Maps gets a lot of its uh, location data from Nokia, including stuff like dr driving directions and all. That I figure is still as a, an unsolved problem. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is stuff that I know that Google, Yahoo, Microsoft is putting money into. And uh, yeah, that's what we talk about. Who do you want to talk about? So uh, just want to uh, say a few thoughts on non-data and, and how uh, it's kind of evolved in the last uh, uh, few, year, uh, few years and maybe a couple of decades. Uh, from my perspective, I think uh, the end goal that we all want is to have the most accurate description of the world and the most uh, up-to-date description of the world that's in a usable format, right? Um, and this kind of get, got triggered by the uh, two, uh, two things that 
um, uh, to kind of the revolution of of of, uh, of our times. One is the uh, the advent of the internet, where data from being kind of the uh, domain of kind of the geo trees uh, became so influential for ordinary consumers to consume via internet. Second was the availability of of, of cheap uh, GPS devices. Again, uh, consumers are, are, are able to kind of feel firsthand uh, how data kind of influences them and, and, and kind of data gives them confidence to navigate in an unwarm environment. So that's a, those are things that kind of triggered and that um, initially started off with the uh, uh, digital marketing companies providing you as uh, as as up to date as they can in terms of uh, providing you updates of our um, uh, for data, let's say once a quarter, right? Uh, now that has kind of evolved much faster. So now people want the people assume that you have the the facts of the, of the world, that is the roads and and localities and, and the points of interest all mapped. And but they want to have much more real time updates, things like traffic, things like road closures, things like uh, uh, even uh, perhaps restaurant menus, which is uh, uh, I was seeing all the time. So that's something that uh, data is evolving towards. Um, uh, there has been um, efforts in in, uh, in GIS, especially to make the data uh, quite structured. Uh, so every bit of data is, is exactly described, and, and what it means is uh, perfectly specified. But I think as you kind of uh, start investing in this more uh, uh, loosely defined data, then people have to get used to the fact that some of the it's going to be unstructured, and we should treat data as a valuable resource, regardless whether it's structured or unstructured. So that's valuable in itself. Um, um, the other uh, in, uh, rise uh, in the last few years, of course, has been the contribution of uh, user-generated content. So uh, users themselves uh, feel the need that there's data missing in out in the world, and then being using server products, um, Google Map is being one where they contribute their local knowledge uh, to to the system by either drawing maps, identifying points of interest, and so on. So uh, the domain of uh, kind of data generation, which used to be in in these multiple uh, digital mapping companies now actually moved into the user data. So we'll have to see how uh, these two coexist and how these two kind of uh, interact with each other. And, and, and one, one interesting question is will all the data in the world be uh, generated by users? I think that's something that we can discuss and debate over. And uh, the final point that I can make is that uh, even though data was driven by these applications, things like mapping on the internet or, uh, or navigation on the road, uh, I think it's some uh, value to see data as its own state. So essentially, collecting accurate data and making it uh, making it available is uh, good in itself. Okay. Okay. For a question to you guys. On one side, uh, we seem to be uh, you know trying different ways to monetize. Uh, on, on the other side, you're having uh, you know folks like OpenStreetMap kind of kind of getting data sort of cloud source. How do you guys actually see tackling this and? I mean, obviously, it's an area that you're working on quite actively. So, so I, I can I can talk about from a data standpoint. There are two issues, right? When when you talk about consuming data, and that's where OpenStreetMap maps or OSM comes in, is uh, the restrictions to use data and the availability of data. A lot of people here touched upon tier two cities, tier three cities, and and lack of uh, data available. Uh, and that's where enter OSM, where we want the crowd to come in and the local people to come and actually add those uh, information and then it is available to everybody. Uh, so that is that is essentially one of the things about uh, OpenStreetMaps is uh, that get the data at one place and make it available to everyone. Uh, and that is that was sort of the driving force behind the data. Um, regarding the monetization aspect, I think it will come as the as the data consumption paradigms and the applications evolve over time uh, and the industry is evolving very fast so we you know just like today we saw a bunch of paradigms or, or applications so to speak but very soon uh, we will see newer applications and things to come um, so that's how i see uh, proprietary data or curation effort which is focused towards a particular goal versus a crowdsource and a map that is available to everybody, a, a geospatial graph that is available to the world, which is basically open OSM. So you have a thing. Um, well, actually, uh, let me just ask my question. Sure. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts about monetization, right? So I think uh, traditional digital map providers uh, were really, uh, their business model was based on 
on supplying data. I think that's going to be get uh, harder and harder as, as uh, much of the data, uh, any factual data becomes available. But then I think one thing to realize is that there are actually multiple tiers of data. There, depending on the application, uh, you, are, you, you, you have one kind of uh, level of data that you want to uh, have if you want to just display pretty maps. Another level is when you want to be able to load the local search. And then a completely different level is when you want to have turn button navigation at your traffic. So there's kind of different levels that you can play with, even if you're just in the data market, and say, okay, uh, monetization can still be done in the higher levels. The second approach uh, is what I think Google has taken, is that uh, Google does not try to make uh, revenues out of the data itself, but actually our experience around the data, data. So essentially, when you use APIs that are uh, used, uh, that are performing search in the data, or if they're performing directions, that's when uh, third-party developers uh, will have to pay. And of course, uh, consumer experiences also get monetized by advertising around those experiences. So it's not just the, the data that's monetized, but the experience that gets monetized. All right. Uh, what about you? What about uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, no, so at that point, uh, that is the jumping point for any startup. For example, anybody wants to get into the scene, the first thing they say is, okay, where do I find this data and how do I give it to my users? Or how do I accept data and make my own database about it? Uh, Yahoo does the same thing. Uh, API is free for like uh, small scale. The moment you actually want to make money of it, make a business of it, talk to our guys. Uh, so you're absolutely right. The data in itself isn't psychosat. I mean, Indra Nagar is Indra Nagar. But uh, the kind of experience that you give to a developer or to a business that's consuming this data, that is where the value lies in this industry right now, at least. If someone in the audience wants to add to this, you can take an audience opinion on this point. Anyone wants to take a photo? Got it. Yeah, uh, just from his point. See, one, one of the things is I think the broad spectrum of industries that can leverage GIS is something that I think it, it's still at the tip of the iceberg stage. Because we, I think GIS has been at least there for about 100 years, as far as I know, in terms of uh, 50 years maybe. More than that, yeah, you are the expert on that. First, the GIS map is drawn by a cave map. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay, technically it's been there for ages. But Unlike, for, for example, you know, I, I work with tools like, you know, SAS and SPSS, which are essentially the same. You are layering different types of data. However, I think in terms of layering relevant data on top of this platform is something where I think there are a lot of applications that are able to use. Well, uh, no, absolutely. And uh, OSM isn't OSM just by itself. It's a combination of a whole bunch of open source tools that are around and give the developer experience to that person. Yeah. I was talking to somebody during lunch and we were talking about the insurance industry, for instance. You know, if, 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 if I'm paying for an automobile insurance in, say, Chennai, versus, say, I'm pay, pay, paying in Bhopal, say, which is in Madhya Pradesh, I end up paying the same amount. Why should it be when, you know, one is on the coast and another is in the central part of the country, right? We haven't still brought in that intelligence into into the insurance industry, so I think this one is down. Yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, it's, I agree with you that like, third, third parties, right, have a lot of value to add. I think the example that I want to highlight is like, uh, there's an NGO called Transparent Chennai, uh, which was uh, which is basically trying to figure out uh, what are the development areas in Chennai and what needs to be addressed and so on. So they actually mapped out like, uh, clean uh, public uh, toilets in Chennai, right? And they try to do geocorrelations between that and, let's say, the residents of the nearby uh, council or something. So they found this interesting correlation. So it's like interesting uh, analysis like that. It's possible now that you have a, a base that is available and then third parties like the Transparency Chennai overlaying their data onto that. Okay, so the, the next next question I'd like to pose to the panel is really with regards to uh, data quality, and we talked about it earlier in different sessions. So, what I'd like you guys to reflect on is what are the different uh, uh, techniques that we're using to tackle this aspect, and how are you engaging communities as well in terms of trying to uh, address this and make it as easy as possible for end users. So, uh, this is, I think, in in terms of when it comes to geospatial, I think data uh, is is the most downstream or the fundamental thing that everything builds upon and if you have the data which is of uh, lower quality I think everything upstream is going to go uh, bad or south from that point on. So cleaning the data, getting the right data, ingesting the data, normalizing it, uh, making sure that we are able to see entities as they are or, or see businesses as they are because there will be multiple sources that may be flowing in the same data or same entities, uh, and then be able to uh, 
mark them, annotate them properly, and serve them. This this is essentially the data life cycle, right? And and we are from a uh, from from an industry standpoint, we're looking at touch points from each at each level as to so OSM is think about as a starting point, and then when you come to tools that are on the periphery of OSM are uh, are the next level of things where people start to say. Uh, or Wikimapia, for example, right, where people can come and start to correct listings, and and that gives us another signal. So that is how we are looking at how every step of the way we can get the community involved and get the collective wisdom from the people who are there on the ground versus us who are sitting. Let's say I'm sitting in Hyderabad, so I don't know anything about Bhopal or or Chennai for that matter. But the person who is in Chennai for years and years, they can actually. Uh, potentially even in sleep can say this is the right address and this is the, this address actually is the red house next to the pink house or green house whatever which I can't so so that is how we are tackling that problem to complement our effort with the community effort as and when we can actually instrument it and provide the interfaces um, uh, just to add to that another major problem that at least that I see amongst the couple of teams in Yahoo is uh, uh, nothing in India is spelled the same way across this thing. I don't know the correct spelling of Dipsandra. I don't know. Um, I, I don't think we have decided whether we are Bengaluru or Bangalore yet. Uh, and uh, this, it, this is the part where the data starts. Some parts of it make sense, some part don't. And we need to, uh, uh, a lot of it is done by algorithms, of course, but we actually have to have human intervention where people keep telling us, uh, I, you sent me down the wrong road, you sent me wrong, uh, the wrong way, and uh, you're pointing me a city in, uh, you're telling me Surat instead of Surat Kal. You know, uh, these, these problems are huge in India, and we are, of course, we are trying to put a bend on it, but really tough so far. So, Arun, this is one place where Hyderabad is ahead of Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. <laughs> yeah, so this one, uh, yeah, just affirming that data quality is a hard problem, right? I think there are multiple dimensions that you can look at. One is the coverage, so it's how much of the data you've captured in, 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 when you compare it to the real world. And that's by definition unknown because you don't kind of don't know what you don't know. And you can use estimates like for a total number of roads to kind of capture that, but it's a very rough, right? The other aspect, I think on fine grain level, I think user uh, input has been a very good mechanism, whether they when they report a column or they're actually going to the road, they're actually trying to make the data quality better. So that's a good indicator of uh, how data quality is improved. But it's hard work. One interesting point to add, you know, basically what we are trying to do is uh, instead of attacking a problem, we are going to the source of the problem. If we can able to define one source of truth of the data, then that will, you know, oversee almost 80% of the problem. So what we are trying to do it is a, instead of a top-down approach, we are trying to have a bottom-up approach because we are providing to the, uh, in fact, whatever the maps we see from Naptek or Nokia is generated back in Hyderabad in Bhagavad so we know that what kind of quality of data we generate, you know. And uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, uh, probably luckily is not alive, his name is spelled in 72 different forms in maps. Uh, you know, so uh, that is how he has been represented. So what we are trying to say is, is it any way to have a tolerance defined, whereby I can generalize the data. At the best we are able to arrive on the NAVTEC data set is 48.2%. So that is what the tolerance that we are able to bring in, and we pass on our bug to Google and uh, you know Microsoft and then on. All right, I think with that... Uh, I have a question for the panel. See, yeah, we're, we're just coming there. Uh, with that, we kind of close this segment, and then we'd like to take about uh, five minutes on questions around you know the consumer experience, data quality, APIs, etc. And I'd be very keen if there's anybody in the audience who's actually very familiar with the the open GIS tools, uh, actually advocated by OSGOs, if any of you have experiences on that, I'd love you to talk about it. Yeah, yeah so uh, i sort of uh, been working in the space for a bit. Uh, uh, started volunteering for the Open Street Map Foundation, uh, started adding ones of data, and also uh, consulting for a lot of nonprofits, uh, helping them set up their own geospatial infrastructure. Uh, so, what I started with uh, is that collecting data on the ground and using the open source uh, Open Street Map uh, tool ecosystems and uh, trying to upload this kind of data. So, one of the things that I've experienced, and while well, I share this kind of uh, stuff with other people, who would want to contribute data is that uh, the user experience is not that great. Uh, and that's uh, one of the places where uh, Yahoo or Microsoft or Google is uh, ahead of what it is right now. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's really about the user experience uh, when it's mostly, so one of the things that uh, works quite well with MapMaker is, so that's, that was about my question in the morning, that how do you think MapMaker is quite uh, well adopted in India than 
uh, OpenStreetMap the data set. Uh, because more or less it's the same features that's happening, but just that the data is going to Google and the other data gets into an open repository. Uh, so user experience is something which uh, we found uh, uh, difficult. Uh, apart from that, uh, most of the tools around the OpenStreetMap with the open geospatial data ecosystem is quite brilliant. Uh, it starts from uh, it starts from collection, uh, editing. Uh, it, it, they have their own ways of tagging and the entire system of tagging schemes. And you know, your own you can apply for a tag. It gets voted up and it gets selected into the database. Uh, and then that's the tagging scheme. And then you have ways of represent and storing the data. Uh, you have tools and ecosystems around the PostgreSQL and PostGIS database systems. Uh, and then it comes to representation, how you how you represent this map on, the, on a paper or on the web. Uh, so you have a set of tools which does that, like renderers. Uh, you can write themes for these renders where you can easily create thematic maps. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, something which I found uh, interesting, that I've, I've been able to generate thematic maps quickly out of OpenStreetMap uh, than with Google Maps, because I can write my own custom style sheets and say that, you know what, I don't want these roads on the map. I don't want these stores on the map. I just want these schools or you know, a bunch of these things on the map. So that's something which is quite interesting. Uh, apart from that, uh, the data quality, uh, it's still a problem, like it, it's still a hard problem that like everyone's trying to tackle. Uh, it again depends on the number of people who are computing the data uh, into the repository and things like that. So yeah, that's uh, that's probably it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, could you pass okay, after that? Yeah. Raise your hands, please. I'll pass on the mic. Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to differ with one of the panelists because, you know, one of you said that you know, in terms of user generated content, I feel that, you know, it's more of a botheration for me than, you know, encouraging. One of the things that I usually do is switch off all the layers where there is user generated content because. <laughs> Uh, typically, our mindset is go to that authentic source which will provide me the right data. For instance, if I were to look at palace grounds here, all around palace ground, including Makri Circle, is marked as palace grounds, right? So that is something that's a disturbance for me than, you know, using it as any authentic source. Yeah, uh, Okay, uh, maybe pass to Sir. Mahfoud, you want to respond? So, when I said uh, user generated content is important, it's, uh, it's not necessarily important when it's raw, uh, but when you actually take it and curate it and have the processes to make it sure that you have attributes like canonicalization, which means that you have one copy of the same uh, the thing in your database, then you actually make a really good use of it. And I think the, the value in at least uh, India is shown in the fact that the India map is. is uh, most predominantly contributed by users, and that's now kind of used in like Google Maps for navigation, which means it's at a very high bar of, of content, uh, content quality. I just wanted to add a small point to what uh, Sajid uh, said about map, map, map monitor versus open street map. Uh, I think it also has to, apart from usability, it also has to do with uh, uh, people who contribute being the end consumers themselves. So uh, Google Maps is a public facing uh, platform. Of course, OpenStreetMap can be used for it, but uh, the primary use uh, has been by de developers for OpenStreetMap. On the other hand, let's say uh, my house is there or my office is there, and I want to put a map of my office in our contact page, then I would like that to be added to Map Market, and any route mismatch we will report and then uh, it is in our interest in some sense to do that. Uh, that is the same thing. So, so uh, basically, having um, a mechanism of for users, like a large number of users, to consume this data in a simple way, that's like the biggest incentive, I think, for user generated content. If you don't have that mechanism in place, uh, yeah, it's going to be hard work to get users to contribute. And to just add to, um, the comment about user-generated content, I think in a lot of scenarios, that's the only choice we have. There is no authoritative source as such. And even if you want to think like some provider is an authoritative source, they are also basically doing the same thing, right? They're just having people walk on the street with GPS devices. So, and they're just making the best estimate of what uh, street or what palace grounds is. So, there's no such thing as authoritative and user-generated content is uh, what we have, which is the best thing in many parts of the world. Uh, 
uh, request to the audience when you make a question, could you just call out your name, please, so we, we could refer to you when we respond. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Vipul. So, uh, my question was actually leading out from the discussion around user generated content. I, uh, I agree completely that you know it is a kind of good source of uh, updated information, right? Because things keep changing and then users report that enough. But uh, I am pretty sure that there are accurate sources uh, which are. Uh, so, so for example, when you plan a layout, right, you know which number, uh, down the street, second main, third cross, right, which number is 275, 200, those things don't change, right, and uh, surprisingly, I remember that those things used to be on paper maps, which were available in electronic form, and I, I faintly remember that these booklets of iShare city maps being circulated like decades ago, right, uh, where uh, those things, uh, have they been lost, have they been hoarded, or like, what happened to them? Those, that data, for example, house, street, num uh, street house number information, right, it's pretty much unavailable. So, uh, my question, in a summary, is there are definitely more accurate sources out there which are static, which don't change, why aren't they in... Uh, any forum uh, or uh, by and Yeah, we'll take that and then probably answer it together. Go ahead, the gentleman left is It's on the left. No, one minute. Yeah, I have a question related to government things. How a government organization collects data? Like for Google. Can we park that for the next segment? We will be having a section of the government. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, yeah, so the question that I have is, uh, and the aspect of this user generated data is that, you know, uh, most of the time the formal name is never used. For example, uh, if I go to an auto driver and ask him where is Kengal Hanumanteya road, he won't know. But if I ask him where is the double road, he knows. Right? So, uh, and nobody calls it uh, KGPS or whatever. Everybody calls it Majestic. So, that is another problem which I, you know, it's very hard uh, when I use all these maps. How do you get stuck with that uh, location area single? Yeah, so um, the one way to tackle that is to have uh, multiple names for a feature, right? Uh, so your road can be called uh, multiple names, and it's, well, obviously on, on map render you can show only one, right? So you can actually search by the road uh, by different names, so that's one way to do that. Exactly. So you have like old and obsolete names also along with uh, your latest, whatever, primary and official names. That's the question, as a user myself, I haven't really seen a way where you can actually see multiple names you hover over a place or something. Is that something that you guys will I mean, probably think of because it's a practical problem? Yeah. Uh, is your question that should we show multiple names when the, the user is that what is the uh, question? Most, most often I don't get the most commonly used name. I get the official name which nobody uses. That's the problem. That's the problem. And, and I think suddenly they talk to how we, we tackle that problem. And it's from a, from, a, from a concept standpoint that's pretty much the same. But I think your question was, should we, on the UX or on the user interface, should we actually show multiple names? And, and uh, my thinking is that we should pivot to what the user has searched for, rather than giving 13 different names, which could again be a confusion. It's a little more complicated than that, I'll tell you why. If, say for example, I'm looking at the map of Bangalore, and I'm looking at some of the suburban areas, I hover over the map, so I wouldn't even know, I wouldn't have searched for it to okay. start. So it's actually a practical UX issue. Anyway, I don't know if there are answers on the panel as of now, but that's a practical UX issue. It's a valid point, really. Uh, just, one answer. Yeah, just one more uh, point um, on the question about uh, having standard resources of data, right? So yes, uh, you can have start thinking about it, then you actually see that uh, when you go to the government, they actually have multiple views on the, on the same set of data. So if you ask, okay, what are the sub localities or localities in the city, then your water department will have a different set of data, you'll have your exit will have different, different data and, and your administration will be different. So in, in terms of a user uh, uh, visible uh, uh, data that kind of converts to uh, experiences, then it seems better uh, from at least in our experience to actually let the users define what the, the divisions are. So even though and the official divisions are actually don't really quite uh, influence what the users want. And there is no clear, like there is no one, one truth, right? So for example, we talk about locality, but the government doesn't ever talk about locality. It's more municipality. So it's, it's district, it's taluk, it's municipalities, right? And municipalities, they basically one locality could be in one municipality, multiple or two or four, right? So so that representation isn't there. Uh, so those are some of the things that that so are sort of different. Example was right? They never change, and they're not there. On that. Right. 
House numbers, I think, have, in my parents' house, I've been reading about like two or three times in the last 20 years. They don't take as much as like, there's a shopping cart park element. Also, I'm not sure how comfortable the government would be giving you the house addresses and names of everybody else. No, 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 no. This is recall what I said. These were on paper maps. These are still on paper maps, but they're not on electronic maps. Maple, I, I request we take that offline. Yeah, sure. We've tried to attempt to that. The gentleman there, and we'll probably, uh, that's you. Oh, we, we'll thank you. With that, we'll move on. That'll be the last question. I just want to follow up on um, the question of you know displaying multiple names. But you know, there, you talked about a trend toward uh, more user-generated content rather than from single data sources when kind of in older days of GIS. But um, do you think that the actual visual representation, you know, maps are very visual, hasn't kept up with the fact that now we have multiple diffuse sources. Because one of the things that frustrates me a lot of times with mapping is, you know, Google will have done some reverse geocoding, and they say, okay, here's this plume on the map. But there's actually a large uncertainty about it. That's only, they only really looked up the street, and they're giving me the middle of the street. And yet, the marker doesn't really visually indicate the data uncertainty. So I was wondering if, any of you are looking at specifically your visual representation and your UI layers of how you represent kind of the messiness data instead of hiding it from the user? So I think there are kind of two very good questions in there. Uh, one is the visual representation, right? And, and you're right, the maps haven't really kept up in terms of uh, uh, giving kind of uh, individual experience to users. I think that's definitely an interesting area. I think if you look at what Google has done with search, it's more about uh, trying to make the search personal, and I think that's a good area to explore uh, to make uh, the map, the visual look of the map, really uh, something that the user can relate to. Uh, the second part you might about geocoding. Uh, yes, um, I think uh, the geocoding has to get a, a lot better uh, in terms of uh, going. I would say at the extreme, going towards point geocoding. So essentially, you you start labeling all the points that you know. So the old method of kind of uh, interpolating from localities and streets and so on will end up in that. Uh, in that scenario. So I think uh, users are actually uh, able to contribute a point uh, addresses in many cases, and that will kind of help the geocoding aspect. Great. Uh, we'll now move on to the second segment. Uh, so far, we've kind of covered the consumer side of things and with the APIs and stuff like that. The second segment, we want to talk about uh, what this means for uh, what geospatial technology means from an app, how can we apply it for multiple industry verticals as well as in terms of how do governments globally try and use it. Uh, I'll probably kick it off with a bit of a context here. Uh, you know, uh, uh, typically uh, enterprises have quite a challenge, you know. They're, they're very, very good at handling applications and, you know, databases and stuff around that. But the big challenge that you see in enterprises is that the folks who can actually apply the geospatial technology are actually sometimes the engineering teams. They're completely different team, and these are siloed within enterprises. So that's a huge challenge in terms of the applications where it's understanding the geospatial technology and vice versa. So in a sense, uh, these are, in a sense, converging, but IT departments and organizations really haven't changed. So that's one challenge. When you look at governments, really, I think the big challenge is really not budgets, but more about prioritization, decision making, and you know, things go round and round. Uh, so per se, if you look at it globally, uh, bulk of the uh, spend on geospatial technology has been around the, the defense of the government primarily. And uh, you also have the, the telecom guys as well as if you look at uh, uh, utility companies globally are beginning to use geospatial technology. I'm not sure how many of you uh, noticed this in the last 48 hours. Uh, we actually had this um, uh, startup called Space Time Insight, which actually was, uh, you know, uh, in a, uh, $40 million was sort of, uh, they got, uh, they got uh, funding. Uh, for essentially, uh, you know, to uh, at the intersection of the geospatial and the, the smart grid. So they're really going to map energy and smart grid data in the US. So that's sort of what uh, has been a recent development as well. Uh, since in that sense, uh, there's a lot of huge potential. It's not that enterprises haven't really been using geospatial stuff, but it's sort of a lot of them have used some of the earlier client-based, um, you know, applications and, you know, the kind of leading vendors there. 
um, have been like the ESIs and the AWS have been kind of servicing them quite a bit. But now with the, the cloud-based services coming in, so it's quite an interesting challenge for them to sort of figure out how to leverage the assets that you have and also kind of leverage the, the move to the cloud that's really happening. So I would actually request, uh, uh, you know, um, NR to probably who's actually done a lot of work around this space to touch upon what are um, different industry verticals doing with geospatial technology, what are the kind of applications that we're using, and and some uh, and subsequently maybe we'll do the garment round. So maybe you'd like to touch upon the industry verticals. Thanks. Guys, probably I'll give up a big perspective. Let me start with some good news. We've been asking about the open source maps to be used and so on. Good news for you is Indian Defense Government has bucketized $8 billion for the MAKE program. So, and Indian Defense want only open source. So, probably our friends may not like here, but uh, that's, it. that's how it goes. So, so I want to say uh, the. We are getting into a wind of seed. Uh, it's more, GS is becoming more pervasive. So that is one of the things which is driving all industry verticals. That means which Aaron just brought in. The space time ink is just for smart grid GIS. And uh, anybody has got a guess how much percentage they are growing year on year? There are so many budding uh, entrepreneurs who have been bidding it. Any wild guess? Okay, let me make your life easier. They are growing at 300% year on year. Okay, that, that's a growth that you know the, the GIS is kindly pushing in. Uh, probably, I would like to say that the recent research report which published this is that close to $3.7 billion uh, of business is that till 2017 for GIS, okay? Which I talk about data and application alone. Nothing to do with hardware or software or licensing. This is pure application space. And with that, uh, probably some good news is for the uh, government here is uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I got statistics from the US because that is one of the primary focus for us where we have the records. But they say that uh, GIS is the only industry which is helping the US government to uh, you know, uh, trade off the um, unemployment problems. GIS industry is giving them 35% year on year employment for their citizens. You know. That's how they're trying to tackle it up. And uh, if you're having a segment, I have a breakup also here. If you are a cartographer, you are more into map, map creation, and so on. Uh, the business opportunity year on year, which has been generated, is 22%. And if you are in the survey and mapping kind of a thing, it gives you 16% year on year additional employment. That's what I'm talking about. And if you are into other, generally not related to cartographer or GIS, it is growing at 14% year on year as well in terms of employment. Uh, that's a good news. When they move in, for cost and arbitrage and the work pool, obviously it will be taken up to the different countries which comes into uh, India and China as well. And yeah, having uh, said that, if I come to the Indian context, from a global to you know US to the Indian context, all government agencies are making GIS as uh, one of their primary policy and action decision in every department. Okay? Uh, recently, NSDI has been put up and in parliamentary commission where we have been pushing hard to the you know, the existing government to get an approval is on the National Geospatial Regulatory Authority bill to be passed. So that you know, that means now we will define how our standards of GIS data should be. If anybody wants to publish data, what are the standards they have to fall in? What things should be in place? So that generate more data, and you know, most of your source of the problem and the data will presume to be you know eradicated. That's the process. And the largest spend in terms of a mapping, uh, Indian Railways has recently approved 40 crores of uh, budgetary amount just to build their GIS database, okay, and it is going to be interoperably used by the telecom players to run their optical fiber cable all across their rails, okay. So you know that Indian Railways is one of the biggest network in terms of the linear, you know, assets. So that, that's all the come of these statistics. And in terms of the budding engineers who have got some brilliant ideas from real estate to the using it and the LBS and so on, um, in terms of business revenue that we are targeting is 10 billion per year is the Pie that is available in the market. So whoever wants to become the next Bill Gates can eye on GIS. So, okay, that's the kind of a message it comes in. And uh, when we talk about India, IT and so on, obviously our uh, red dragon also rises up. So I'll touch upon on China, how they are you know putting it up, we keep an eye on it. And uh, they are actually in the GIS software business, they're growing at RMB 500 million year on year. And when I talk about the apps business, the RMB 3 billion yuan has been marked in GIS. If you put it in a statistical graph per se, uh, I would say that they are growing at, at 50 times what were, what were they 10 years ago. 
So that means uh, I don't know about their construction, I don't know about their cheap labor, I don't know about their milk products, but I'm sure that GIS is growing faster than us. Okay, that's in China. And if I come to the much more, see, if you see that I'm also having a layer approach. I went to the global, US, China, India, and I come to Karnataka. Okay, so if I come to Karnataka, uh, one of the early adopters of GIS is uh, probably uh, Rajesh may be happy, Andhra and Karnataka. Okay, not Hyderabad and Bangalore. <laughs> so Karnataka has pumped down many of the new initiatives. And how much of you know uh, the road information systems, which they called as uh, exactly web RIS? That's what they name it up. And now Karnataka schools, which under the Sarva Siksha Abhyan SSA, they are going to map almost 74,000 Karnataka schools to be mapped, and that will be monitored. The first one to go into this technology is Gujarat government, followed by Andhra and then Karnataka. So what I'm basically trying to say is it all comes under the e-governance umbrella and try to put it in. To touch upon the verticals now, having given all the statistics. Uh, I have some questions on the government side. Uh, which are the major departments in, in, in the central and the state governments in India which are sort of uh, uh, pushing the geospatial um, uh, task, so to speak. That's a good question. Uh, basically, any uh, GIS primary funding comes from the land department. Okay, that, that is one of the things uh, properly uh, creating into a lot of trouble. If I say the recent example, Municipal Corporation of Delhi has come up with the automation of the building plan approval. So the first department to go to you is the uh, land department or the revenue department, followed by the utilities. It comes up. Now what the government has also come up a little smarter is here is they are trying to get the central funding. How many of you are aware of our APDRP program? It's for the energy and utility program where they are trying to get the smart meters so that the revenue leakage from the you know, electricity distribution is cut out. Nothing to do with Anna Azara here. But basically what we are trying to put in here is where all we can do a plug-ins and check-in so that we can get the revenue to the government. So the third one is the uh, utilities framework which is coming to the future. Um, what does the NSDI do? Okay. How many of you are aware of NSDI? Are they good? Uh, it's considered to be a godfather for the defining the standards. It's called National Spatial Data Infrastructure. Okay? It's kind of a governing body formed under it, if you want some things I say that. It was first noted by Department of Space, uh, no, uh, Space in 30th October 2000. They said uh, something has to be done because that's what, uh, you know, how many of you are aware of a Gagan program? Yeah, fairly good, yeah. So Gagan, basically, you know, GPS, you know, Galileo, you know, GLONASS, you come into Gagan. We want to try out our own individual GPS system because Uncle Sam and shut down any time the signal and the are black. So we don't want to get into that. So that is one thing. And it was formed under the Survey of India. So the General of Survey of India has made us a chairman. And then the head of NSDI was created. He becomes a member secretary. Primarily, uh, you know, uh, cabinet approved the NSDI in 2005. Three uh, you know, things that they want to drive is to bring the standards. They have got uh, 16 nodal agencies, primarily government departments. So one, one of the gentlemen asked that where is the source of you getting the government data? So earlier what happened, government departments were very conservative. Okay, um, uh, You won't believe that when I asked for a utility map uh, to plan for Hyderabad Metro Rail, uh, it's a hand scribbled diagram. I say, this is where the underground sewer is there. I cannot test it on the ground, right? So they just scribbled a paper and said, this is where your manhole is. Okay, so uh, that is where, in, so what NSDA tried to bring is, they brought the Survey of India map. They digitized all the Survey of India map in different scale, 250K, 100K, 50K, 25K, 10K, and 5K. And they tried to form a cluster out of it. And this data is shared across all the government agencies within India. So that, that is what NSDA first ensured. And uh, to be precise, the 2002 July a strategy and action plan was endorsed. And uh, how many of you are aware that NSDA is the first government agencies which is uh, OGC compliant, put up the meta standards onto the web. Okay, so not US, not UK, not any other country. So we can be very proud of. Probably we may be last in the game is what we thought, but it's like a turtle, you know, kind of a rabbit race kind of thing. Just leading them out. And uh, we we also have a OGC compliant web services.
with a 128 bit encryption and the NIC National Informatics Center has been endorsed to operate and give it up. So many of the people are asking at uh, how to use the OSM to take it up. It's a very simple procedure. If you have generated a map where you want to publish and take it to OGC, just write a mail to Ministry of Defense and External Affairs, get their stamp, don't put the military establishment or some 52 you know things which you should not supposed to publish get it stamped and thereafter you own the IP or you can publish it to NSDI. Yeah, uh, see the survey settlement and land records department sorry the survey settlement and land records department in Karnataka had started a major digitization exercise about 10 years or so before it under Southern 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 Southern. Southern. so I just wanted to know what are the updates is that exercise complete or why, still, why was it? Yes, still complete. See, what happens is that is what the difference between the private and public, you know. Private, for example, any of the map provider want to publish, they can publish. They will not face the litigation. But when you publish it from a government body, you, you are an engine or a missionary and you own that commitment, you know. So if I say you, are, you have a land by 60 uh, you know, meter by 40 meter and suddenly you have a land of 45 meter, then you will file a case of a litigation. Okay, so where this process is being delayed is one. And second thing what happened, there are many duplications which are into the system. That means for the same pata, for the same survey number, there may be three original documents. And so those are things which are delaying the process. Uh, is the gentleman from ISC there? Uh, yeah, I think he's done some work on the Karnataka Geo portal. So do you want to talk about that? Thank you, sir. Myself, Umesh, and uh, we have been working on Karnataka Geo Portal. As uh, Anas sir told, uh, we have been uh, implementing that uh, Survey of India Portal framework into our Karnataka Geo Portal, and uh, it will be in uh, 50 k scale. And uh, soon we have been promised from Survey of India that uh, we'll be putting 1 to 10 k maps also. Uh, even I would like you to please check the Karnataka Geo Portal dot in website. Uh, you will be getting a lot of information there. Uh, even uh, 2001 to 2011 census data we are updating. The 40% of the data has been updated. Uh, in uh, by the coming uh, December, by the end of this year, you will be getting the 2011 data census data in that uh, geo portal website. Uh, so I would like you to please register it. Uh, it's a pre-registration. Uh, you can check uh, complete data and you can give us the feedback so that uh, we can uh, make it uh, much better in the future days. Thank you. What's the data is at what level? 1 is to 50k. 50, 50. The census data. Census data is uh, uh, containing from uh, GP level, village level and JP level. Giving a village yeah, 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 village level. Uh, it contains 170 attribute level information also. Thank you. We'll take one or two questions on this segment and move on to the next one. <laughs> so, does NSDI plan on standardizing Indian addresses very much? So, like any anything you can share about that or the plans that? There are two draft policies that already has been made on the you know the standards. Uh, the idea here is first of all the mapping, uh, the base mapping is not ready. So what they have taken us, they have taken up at, at the district level or a mandal level of the mapping done. Now the next level is the physical survey that has to be carried out over here. So Survey of India help has been solicited to generate the map. So as in Survey of India makes up on the 5000 scale, actually it's talking about 1 is to 10,000 but Survey of India has initiated at 1 is to 5000 scale. At part of 1 is to 5000 scale we will be capturing the street numbers and door numbers which will be going back to the database. No, but is there a plan to standardize the Yes, oh, yes, yes. they it. Bye. One last question, we move on to the next segment. Uh, my name is Sajjad. Uh, so, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was trying to help my friend uh, who works for Greenpeace. So, uh, so, what they wanted was uh, they wanted a set of geocoded pin codes um, uh, to run uh, their campaigns. So, what they did was they uh, approached the India Post and uh, they signed up on the website and uh, bought a CD uh, which was shipped to this uh, friend of mine. Uh, with the CD didn't work. Uh, they tried writing to them, calling them, 
the data doesn't work and it's not properly geocoded. Things were totally broken. Uh, and then uh, the same day, I found that this, this interesting company called geopincodes.org, which sells this data. Uh, just for India, it's 65 euros for a 30 day license. So you actually have this level of, uh, you know, you can market this data, and there are people who are willing to buy the data. And Greenpeace bought a year valid license, a year long license from the, uh, the other organization. So, I mean, I'm just wondering why uh, the government or the national mapping agency is not uh, coming up to like market this data, which is which uh, on top of which they say. We pay a lot of tax, so we need more money. <laughs> to give a direct answer, it's quite unfortunate, but I'll give a solution and then go to the, the other side. If there's any problem, then please reach out to your regional national informatics center. They have every data backup in their place. So you want anything, sensors, election data, electoral, whatever it is, they have a copy of it. So that will solve the immediate problem. But the second thing is government objective is never to make a money. Even if you go to Survey of India and take a digital map, that may be one of the cheapest things that you can ever get in a government form. So we, we, now government will never look off making any monetary benefits in selling that data. Yeah. <laughs> you can use geolines for the like, postal codes. If I want, if they have postal codes, whatever form with a disclaimer, it's not accurate, you can download. Right now, the process is very cumbersome. They sell it, they sell it to the CD, but why can't they just put it on the website? Yeah, so that's a separate debate in itself, a separate topic, honestly. Okay, uh, so um, we move on to the next segment. Uh, this, one, this one's really focused around uh, the intersection of um, technology as we speak, you know, uh, the geospatial uh, uh, space is quite um, evolving with a lot of changes, there's so much of impact due to mobility, there is so much of uh, uh, impact due to the cloud aspect as well, and then uh, there's lots of uh, people doing work trying to integrate, um, you know, um, uh, data that is coming from telemetry and SCADA systems. There's a huge big data piece as well that's sort of uh, coming into play. Uh, so I, I'd like to uh, run this session with the panelists and their take on, um, you know, the the trends that is uh, essentially the, the intersection of technology and the geospatial aspect of it as well. So over to you guys. Do you want to start? Um, so like a wish list? Like what, what do I see happening in the industry? Yeah, the how are you seeing? The, the convergence of different pieces of technology. Oh, actually, no, please. Um, uh, actually, this goes back to, uh, I didn't catch your name. Uh, to what Ujjal was saying, he was talking about visual representations of data, not, not, not even just multiple things. My current web browsers and phones are really nice, but I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to like the future. I'm looking forward to Google Glasses. I'm looking forward to having uh, my car tell me where uh, I have to go and in what direction and which roads to avoid. Uh, that is interesting. There's a whole bunch of work obviously happening in that, not just Google, but no, a whole bunch of people in the US and so on. Um, like that. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, I keep talking to my friends at Flipkart and Mitra, and they keep telling me about how they need better ways to get their delivery guys faster to where they're actually delivering their t-shirts or watches or shoes or so on. Uh, and they've done everything they could. They've found the best people who know the place really well and so on. Uh, but now they need a way to algorithmically, with math, figure out what the best way to get a guy to the destination is. And that results in like huge savings for them. And in a, such a thin margin market, uh, solutions like this are what I think is going to start giving the competitive edge. <coughs> so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come to the, I'll first start with a day in life for geospatial, right? Let's say the scenario is, and this is more of a, you know, few years out scenario and we are just starting to look at geospatial as a as a platform or underneath a layer downstream right and build apps on top of it so think about a typical scenario is a is a family with with let's say one or two kids right and and the day if morning you get up you are wondering whether the milkman is going to come and, and arrive with the milk and what time they're going to arrive think about you can actually go click on your tv turn it on and you can actually track uh, track where the where the milk truck is, right? And then you you can know it is going to arrive here in 32 minutes or, or whatever X minutes. Next up, you have to go to a parents teacher meeting. You're running late. You 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 again check on your laptop. How far is it? Which what is the traffic? And then you jump in your car 
And, and the moment you turn on the GPS or you turn on the car, it automatically knows that this is where I need to go next, right? This is your next destination is this school. Now you've done the parents teacher meeting. Now you're just about the iPhone 5 or 6 or whenever, you know, this scenario comes alive, uh, you know, and you say, hey, I'm going to go to UB City and go to that Apple store and buy it, right? You buy it. Don't use the map here yet on the, on the iPhone. Uh, still keep using what you were using uh, till now. And you say, hey, I'm going to go eat some good food. I go to Coconut Grove. I want to uh, eat some opam and, and, and paratha. And you basically, you punch in that address or, or the name, it gives you not just, the, uh, not just the address and the direction, but also gives you the reviews. It also gives you recommendations on what, so think about the data and app, application and layers that you can put on, on top of this data, right? You, you got good food, now you want to get home, take a good, nice, hot shower. By the time you get home, your, your car is intelligent enough that based on the GIS data, based on the geospatial data, it knows how much time it will take for you to now get home and it can actually turn on the heater at home. So, so when you get home, you can actually get hot water, right? And by the way, you are now in a mood for, hey, there is a, my friends have been talking about a black label limited edition that has just arrived. So, yeah, that's a double black. So, so now you want to pick that up. You punch that in. It will actually tell you on the way, these are the four shops. This shop has this deal going on and you can go pick that up. So think about, this is kind of that application that you can build on top of GIS. Now what does from a technology, let's flip over to technology. What did we talk about? Mobility, cross device connectedness, cloud, big data, and most of all, coming back to geospatial is, the data trustworthiness, because you don't want to end up planning your day or, or, or running through your day on the bad data. So, so that's essentially, you know, my spiel on, on technology. Okay. Thanks for that uh, wonderful look ahead scenarios of how things could play out. You talked about uh, switching on the TV and knowing that your milkman is 42 minutes away or whatever. Uh, if only there was technology to get my milkman to wake up an hour earlier, that would be nice. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think uh, I did a lot of what Rajesh said on uh, on the intent. I think we need to kind of move from uh, the, trying to figure, figure out uh, what the user assets mean instead to kind of go to a model where we understand the user so much that uh, we are able to suggest. Right? That's, that's really something that the GIS can help. The second thing I'd like to comment is that the cloud, the cloudification of the whole GIS space, uh, is a data is moving onto the cloud, will make it much more easier for people to kind of share it across platforms, and then you can actually do start doing very interesting joins across different types of data, and maybe that's actually a business model where people actually make a living selling the proprietary data on, on, on the cloud. Uh, one good thing being a system integrator and looking at these product companies, you know, it's like having a wife and a girlfriend. You can have stuff all. <laughs> so I worked in Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, it's good, it gives all flavor, but you cannot own anything. <laughs> so coming back to the technology things, what uh, we are looking at is coming like a digital convergence kind of a concept, you know. For example, the camera business of what are the XYZ company is killed by a mobile business. Because the moment the mobile OEMs put their camera in, their uh, digital Polaroid camera business got up. So the competition didn't come from the same industry. It came from a totally a tangential way. So the same way the GIS is driving the, you know, the technology going forward. Nowadays, how many people are owning an in-car navigation device that is going to become obsolete? Because your own smartphones is going to act like an infotainment and in-car navigation devices. So whoever in that platform is going to either switch or going to be killed. Okay, so when I look at it, up, the cloud and the big data convergence is making a lot of sense. For example, recently they implemented with the Singapore Government Land Authority. Initially, each of the government departments went for a funding request to the government, say that, say suppose you're a public works department, you ask for 10 million. The utility department, you ask for 15 million. What these people end up doing is, out of this 10 million, 15 million, Christian was mentioning over the data things, you end up in creating data for your own business. So what we went and told to the government, they say, look, Singapore roads are not going to change overnight. Tomorrow morning, it remains the same. 
So why you as a government agencies cannot pull out and bring a base like us and expose that as a web service so that the individual government departments, including your citizens, can use for their own apps and applications that picked up very well. So the convergence of data happened. So of course we had a challenge of a big data hosted in the cloud. 632 layers have been hosted and till now government of Singapore has reaped 11.2 million dollars of savings in one year. Okay, and this is with a uh, uh, thousand concurrent users, okay, and with the refresh rate of 630 layers coming up in less than 23 seconds, we are used to Google search appliance for our application, we used Oracle Spatial. This is the first government NSDI uh, private cloud or hybrid cloud, I try to say, has put up on the web. So, this is where I feel that trend is going on and the convergence is going to make our day. Okay, so we probably um, uh, take a couple of questions at this stage before we close off the final takes from the panelists. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, about uh, convergence, right? You know, yeah, uh, uh, Ashwin. Yeah. So about convergence, right? there are so many more attributes that can be exposed to maps. You know, it, it it need not be all about shopping and iPhone five and all that, right? For example, you know, uh, groundwater levels or water salinity or aridness or fertility of soil or you know uh, weather conditions and, and all these data, you know, data from actual. Uh, data from Earth that keeps on changing, you know, when can we see such kind of uh, um, data be available through maps? The real-time data is already available for agricultural as part of the Mahindra industrial farming equipment whoever buys that Swaraj tractor, we are loading this application and giving to them this for information sake. Other things you can go to publicutilitiesboard.co.sg, Singapore where www.pub.gov.sg we can go to the check water level, flood level through the SCADA system and real time CCTV cameras. It's 24x7 monitor. And uh, what the camera is trying to show that we have a real time streaming coming in over the cloud and it's totally free. We were calling it the Earth API. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, those are examples where it's actually been put into play. Those are specific instances. Yeah. Um, I, I am Nikhil. I am here. So, uh, so I, I'll try to add to what Ashwin just mentioned. So, uh, the lifestyle and the other things are okay, but uh, when we talk in India's context, uh, we are still dealing with what was, what used to be called as third world problems. And uh, uh, right now, uh, there are two, I can count at least two more things which have been added to the basic necessities, uh, other than food, clothing, etc., that is electricity and internet. So, uh, and that is scarcely available uh, in most parts of India. Uh, what I uh, so so it's more of a uh, of an opinion than a question that uh, uh, recently so so what what motivated me uh, with this thought was uh, the recent project which the government has taken up uh, was Aadhaar, which is the world's largest biometric identity platform, and uh, uh, it can be couple that data with the geospatial data to suggest urban planning, uh, to suggest uh, where. where we could use uh, use this data to uh, to probably plan the traffic. Uh, so uh, right now we, we saw that there's a live stream available which which takes the pictures of uh, the traffic signals. Can we uh, make some image processing on top of it? Uh, get the traffic density at particular squares and then suggest a predictive analysis on that to you know actually install more traffic signals at particular checkpoints. Uh, stuff like that. So is something uh, so so one curious question is something like that is already being planned at the government level. Uh, is the other data being ju just being stored or is it going to be consumed in a fashion which, which actually uh, encourages people to come up with uh, some recommendations or some predictions based on the time series analysis uh, of that data or, or something like that. So I, I would really like to know something about it. As part of uh, Agar, we are also involved from Mahindra Satyam on issuing the cards and barcoding. I'd like to take this question in two uh, parts. One is asking, can you use a predictive analysis and use it up? Let me take it up. If you are aware of the EMRI, Emergency Management Research Institute 108, which is another time three kind of a number, we are using this predictive analysis already inbuilt into it. Suppose there is a fire which has happened in a slum area. Okay, typically you don't know what is the damage that has occurred. Okay, so you have to dispatch a paramedics team immediately to this part to rescue people and do a first aid. So what it does is it immediately takes the census data of the slum, which is of course has been given projection in the last one in 2001. So we have extrapolated to the nearest close by, maybe some year plus or minus. So what we've done is that will determine the number of ambulances that has to reach this part. 
and not only the ambulances, okay, suppose there are household, one household may have five people, say for example, and how many uh, first aid equipments that has to be taken, say for example, number of cotton bandages, you know, scissors, injections, is that, and everything, that is predictively done and dispatched. So, to answer your question in the first part, yes, we are doing it, but not at the scale that what you are looking at, but I am always happy that the first step has been taken, so it's only to be, you know, scaled up. The second question is, uh, are there, uh, what we are more try to look it up is Allah is used for uh, data validation and consolidation purposes more than predictive analysis. The, if you see the basic problem in India is that one source of truth, what we have been discussing for quite a is nowhere available. And there is no single owner who will say that yes, these are the data accurate up to 60%, 70%. So the intention of other is something different. But once the primary objective is fulfilled, the government initiative or at the ministerial level, the objective is to go on a larger scale. Okay, I think uh, that would be the last question uh, we need to wrap up. Uh, I would request the panelists uh, to sort of give one futuristic take about 10 years down. What do you see fundamentally changing? Or what do you believe might change or that might change the experience uh, of either consumers or the enterprise in the geospatial space? Shall we start with you? Sure, sure yeah. <coughs> uh, interesting phenomenon over the last couple of years has been this check-in phenomenon, uh, Foursquare, Facebook, so on and so forth. Uh, there are also niche subcultures across the world which are also involved in body modification stuff. I see some sort of convergence happening there. I, pe I see people walking around, no, honestly, I see people walking around where the phone is probably a little tinier, fits in your wallet and is recording your data uh, on a non-stop basis. Just for you, it could be private, this is not something sold or so on. But yeah, I totally see Star Trek board in the future. That's what we're going for. Uh, and yeah, it's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm going to love being a part of it and being able to work with that kind of thing. I'd be happy if my uh, phone battery lasts more than two hours. <laughs> <laughs> that is a major problem, so yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Nice. <laughs> a little replicator for ground. Uh, yeah, so starting. My future is scenario, I think, uh, go glasses on the first step, but I think. Perhaps 10 years from now, we'll have uh, so much data and we'll know so much about the real world that we'll actually have a completely immersive experience instead of actually being there. 10 years, I will be Google Eyes or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think the convergence of these different industries that we think of, right? At, at some point, GPS was uh, a different industry. Now, GPS has become part of the phone, right? And, and eventually, Every phone, including this uh, very generic starter level phones, would have those. And, and I, I agree with Satyan what he said. There would be so much data that would be, it's just processing that data and making sense out of it would be amazing amount of work. Uh, but once we have that, the the mapping of all that is, is going to be uh, great. So I think the convergence is really what is going to uh, kick to the next level of experience and where you can actually uh, pretty much go uh, sitting, go to a business sitting at home uh, and simulate the entire experience is what I think would, would happen. I would say that more of a predictive modeling and uh, digital convergence is a theme is going to be one of the projects we're working with in Army is a digital soldier, you know, soldier C4I. Right? That means how you can use it for healthcare and how you reduce the casualty. Uh, more on this, we are also working on a humanoid robot who can do a complex operations kind of a thing. So mechatronics and telematics, which we are trying out with Intel and other R&D labs. So there is no more data, equipment, and analysis. It's going to be clubbed together as a fusion data. Well, I was just thinking what my take would be, and I was just laughing as I was thinking. Uh, taking on of the battery scenario, the way I visualize 10 years from now, technology will be so sophisticated that we'll all be struggling to figure out how to use it and when to use it. And <laughs> more importantly, <laughs> we're already doing that. Well, imagine 10 years down. <laughs> and then your gadget would be, you'll have nice screens and, and you know, that is, uh, everything in the geospatial stuff will be on your mobile, it already is. Everything else you could dream of would be there. And then it'll kind of start heating up and explode, boom. <laughs> you know? And then yeah. your, your the service providers will actually have insurance that goes with it that your phones can be changed as fast as they explode. I'm just kidding. Anyway, thanks so much uh, for making this an interesting evening. And uh, the panelists are around if you have any questions. And uh, thanks for your patience here.